Well, church family, it's uh, again good to be with you today. Um, because of the meeting after the service, my boss said, you know, so this is a Sunday where you could preach longer. That way she's not too rushed to be here. Um, nobody said yes. Nobody was like, yeah. I thought there'd be claps and cheers and no, nothing. Goodness. Well, church, today uh, the sermon is titled Witnesses, Saved by Jesus for Jesus. And uh, the primary passages of Scripture are going to be Mark chapter 16 and Acts chapter 1 and their corresponding verses. Um, but on this Sunday, you know, most of us have heard of the Great Commission, right? That's, the Great Commission is what all Christians are called to do. Uh, it's every, every Christian church uh, that believes in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has some sort of a missional statement, and it revolves around the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is where we are supposed to go and baptize believers uh, and make disciples. They're some of the final words of Jesus and his marching orders for followers of Jesus. Um, you know, some might falsely believe that, well, as you know, Christians, we're just told that we're just supposed to love everyone, and we don't really know what that means, but we just know it's about love. Because if we've never invested the time in really discerning what is the Christian faith and who is Jesus, then we'll, be, we'll just hear, well, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So it's just about, let's just love each other. But what does it mean to have the love of God? What does it mean to actually love someone like you love yourself? Because not all of us really love ourselves, if we're honest. Instead, it's learning to love ourselves as God loves us. You know, some number of other sermon series all in all of that. But anyway, um, the Great Commission is what we are called to do. Um, we're not called to people. We're not called to love people with a worldly love, which is really an apathetic kind of love. Instead, we are called to go out and love people and make them disciples of Jesus Christ and baptize them in His name, meaning meaning that we invite people into a life where they are reborn and they're renewed by, by Jesus through their baptism in faith. That where the old is gone, the new has now come, and that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live holy and righteous lives. Right? There are so many passages of Scripture that talk about what we are called to do. And today we're going to look in Mark chapter 16 at the Great Commission. Uh, you can find it in Matthew chapter 28, uh, which is usually the one that you find quoted. Uh, but it's also in Mark chapter 16. And in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16, uh, so Jesus is giving his final marching orders, his last instructions to the disciples. And he's just about to ascend into heaven. And he says to them, uh, he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. Now the gospel, uh, it can literally be translated as the good news. Now the good news is that Jesus was born he was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross for our sake. He died a death meant for us to be a propitiation for our sins, which means he takes our place. Our sins are covered by the shedding of his blood. And when we believe in him, we can have now the forgiveness of sins and newness of life. Not only new life now, but because of his resurrection, the promise of eternal life. That's the good news, that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Go into the world and preach the good news. Preach the good news to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And this is kind of an echoing of what Jesus shares in John chapter 3, where he shares that it's because of the love that God has for everyone that he sent Jesus into the world as one only son to save the world. Not to condemn the world, because the world already stands condemned. It's already lost to sin, but to save the world. So you could read this as, oh, well, so you're saying that Jesus is condemning me. No. No, he's been sent to save you. And that's why we have this great commission. We are to go share Jesus with people because we know and understand what is at stake. And we want people to come to a new life and a saving faith in our Savior. And so Jesus shares what we call the great commission. That as believers in Jesus who have been saved from sin and death through Christ on the cross and are raised to new life, that we now have an important job to do. We're to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And I share this with you today because today is Ascension Sunday. It's on the calendar, and uh, you'll find it even on secular calendars. In fact, in other places that really they don't have any, like, so some people are like, well, this is a Christian country, you know, that kind of thing. You know, what country can be Christian? Anywho, um, there are places that are beyond secular that still have Ascension Sunday on their calendar. You might even get work, work off for Ascension Day during the week. 
uh, even though they don't recognize it, I think, which I think is interesting. You find that in Europe a lot of places. But it's just, I've had too much coffee. Um, it is Ascension Sunday today. Back to the point. It is Ascension Sunday where we remember Jesus' ascension into heaven to be seated at the throne with the Father. On Ascension Sunday, we remember that, and we remember the Great Commission, the final marching orders he gives to believers. It, right before, uh, that, sorry, right after Ascension Sunday, next week is Pentecost Sunday, where we remember how the Holy Spirit fell upon the believers and it empowered them to live out the gospel. That they began doing signs and wonders and they went out and they shared the message of Jesus and thousands of people began to be saved. And in the first 300 years, from that point on to the first 300 years, Christianity grew at its fastest rate ever than before. Millions of people were saved. Nations were changed. Eternity was changed. That's what we celebrate next week, this week's Ascension Sunday, where we remember how Jesus ascended into heaven. And you would think that if someone gives like some final statements, some final things they have to say, like, hey, I've been walking with you for three some years, and we've been talking about things, and you know, I've given you the Sermon on the Mount, and these different ethics, and all of these different things I've shared with you, but I'm about to leave, right? I'm going to be gone. This is what I want you to know. And he shares with them the Great Commission. And if you read the full story in kind of like this timeline, then you'll also read, and it's in the beginning of Acts, but as Jesus is sharing the Great Commission, uh, he's also there with the disciples. And you know, he, this is after he's come back from the dead. He's been resurrected. And so there have been these different things that show that he is there and he is real. And he's revealed himself to hundreds of people. And they know he's not a ghost because he ate some fish with them. Like there's all these little things just in the midst of the text. And they're like, okay, so now you're, you're about to do these things. So now you're going to do what we wanted, right? You're going to overthrow Rome and you're going to make Jerusalem powerful again. And the nation of Israel is going to be number one. Right? That's, that's why you came, right? And Jesus gives them the Great Commission, and he reminds them that the day when heaven and earth are remade and the new Jerusalem comes, only the Father in heaven knows that day. Only the Father. What I want you to know, and this is where we pick up in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, what I want you to know is that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and you can worry about end times. You can worry about all these other things. But what you need to know is that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now some people are like, "Why does like what do you mean Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria? Well, that's just the area they were in. They were in Jerusalem. And so he could say, you'll be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem. And then people would be like, oh, so we can just stop. See the limit sign, right? I've been called to Westington Springs, so as soon as I hit 34 out there, that's where I'm done being a follower of Jesus. No. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, this is where they were at, and Samaria was right next door. Like, so it's like, oh, so you're just calling me to like all of Gerald County, right? I don't have to go be like, my witness stops there. No, to the ends of the earth, everywhere you go, wherever people are, you are to share the gospel. This is right before he ascends. Don't worry about the dates and the times when heaven and earth are remade. Don't worry about any of that stuff. You are to do your job. You share the gospel. You have a task to fulfill. Now, we're humans. We're humans, and so, like, intrinsically, we just mess stuff up. Um, think about it this way. Did any of you ever have to take the bus home, or did you ever get home before your parents when you got out of school? And did they ever leave you a note or give you orders, like, you need to do these things before I get home, right? And so you come home, and there's a note on the counter. You need to make sure you clean up the house and set out the beef so that things are ready for supper. Now, what should we do? Obviously, I just got home from school. I'm going to put my backpack where it belongs. I'm going to put my shoes away and hang up my jacket because, you know, that's what kids do. They follow their orders. And I'm going to pick up my note and read what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to do my chores and clean the things, and I'm going to set out the meat first things so that I don't forget. And then whatever time I have left, then I'll just, you know, I'll enjoy it, and I'll probably do my homework and, you know, whatever else I want to do. Wasn't that your childhood? Right? Are those your children? They do those things, right? If your childhood was anything like mine, if you had chores to do and things to be done before your parents got home, that was the last thing you would do. Right? That's at the very end. So much so that we would listen for our parents' vehicle because we lived out in the country, right? So we knew, okay, that person's going slower than everyone else. That might be them. Oh, that's the sound of my dad's truck. And then you would get up and run to get everything done. 
I didn't set out the beef. And so you're hitting the buttons on the microwave and you can't remember how to defrost and you're freaking out because my parents are about to come home. You panic to do everything last minute. This is the way, right? <laughs> my friends, that cannot, be, that cannot be with our faith. We cannot wait until someone is on their deathbed to share the gospel. We cannot wait until we are on our deathbed to try to impart the gospel to our children or our family or our friends. We, we can. It's not good, right? It's not good. We can wait, but why would we? Why would we panic? Why would we wait until the heavens begin to be rolled back like a scroll and we hear the sounding of horns to panic and then try to talk to our loved ones or our family members or our neighbor right across the street that we have known all this time or down the road and instead of actually talking to them and having a relationship with them and sharing our faith with them, we just, well, they're probably okay, right? I don't want to impose. All right, we'll just talk about the weather, complain about the prices, and we're not going to go any deeper. We cannot wait to the last minute. Jesus gives us our task. You will be my witnesses. Not if you want to. Not wait until you hear me coming back. You will be my witnesses. We should be so overwhelmed by the love that the Father has for us, so overwhelmed by the forgiveness that we have through Jesus, so filled with the Holy Spirit, that we cannot and we will not wait to do the work that God has saved us and empowered us to do. Sometimes I think it would be so much easier that when you came to a faith in Jesus, like, you just, you just go. You're just gone. Wouldn't it be easier than dealing with temptation or, or, or trying to share your faith with people? Wouldn't it be easier than the struggles and the sorrows and the sufferings that we go through? To have a faith and a hope in Jesus and then... Maybe you're dealing with cancer and it's terminal. Or maybe it's a loved one. Or maybe you just keep falling back into the same sins again and you try to struggle out of it and for some reason you feel like you just can't and you won't ever be set free from them. You think, wouldn't it be easier just if I just came to Jesus and I gave him my life and then like Elijah in the fiery chariot, you just get taken up. It would be easier, but it wouldn't be good. Because have you ever wondered why, if you have a faith in Jesus, a saving faith, and you have that blessed assurance that you know, you know, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, have you ever wondered why that when you were saved, you were left here on earth? It's kind of a weird thing to think about. Have you ever wondered why you're still here? There's a Scottish pastor from years gone by, and he has this to say. Uh, he says, to every true Christian, these two things may be said. You have need of Christ, and Christ has need of you. Now, the needs obviously are different. You have need of Christ, and he has need of you. The simple fact that a Christian is on earth and not in heaven is proof that there is something for him to do here to do. And if he is not doing it, the neglect shows either that he is not yet a Christian or that he is a Christian who grieves Christ. As long as you're here on earth, you have things to do. And Jesus says, you are called to be my witnesses wherever you go. You are called to be my witnesses. Well, what does it mean to be a witness for the Lord? A witness is, the definition is simple. It's someone who testifies to what they have seen and heard and they verify that, yes, this is true. It's a legal definition. If you're called to be a witness, this is what you do. Now, obviously, you're not called to go to the courtroom to testify your faith to others. It's how you live your life every single day. It's the words you use. It's the way you conduct yourself. It's how you interact with others, how you treat yourself and others. You are to testify to what has been seen and heard. This is the witness of Scripture. This is the witness of saints gone by. This is the witness of my life, what I've seen and what I've experienced. And I will verify what is true. I will verify the freedom that I've experienced. I'm going to verify. I'm going to share these things with you because I'm a witness for the Lord. And so I want you to consider today, what does it mean to be a witness and how do we do it? And I want to share with you that to witness for Jesus, because this is what we're talking about today, your witness, saved by Jesus for Jesus. So if you're a witness for Jesus, then I would say that to witness for Jesus, uh, that we must then love like Jesus. 
to witness for Jesus, we must love like Jesus. Because it's so popular to say, well, Jesus just calls us to love. Well, what does that look like? What does the love of Jesus look like? And you can see it all throughout Scripture, all throughout the New Testament. You will see what the love of Jesus looks like. Today I want to share with you 1 John chapter 2. I love the letters of John. I mean, the Gospel of John is written simply. His letters are written simply. Uh, it was written in a way so that they think, so that somebody who is about in the sixth grade education would be able to plainly read it. And in 1 John chapter 2, it says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, I wanted to say originally, to be a witness for Jesus, we must live like Jesus. And I think some of you might get caught up on the fact that Jesus was this long-haired hippie that walked around in sandals and didn't have a house. And I don't want you to get caught up on that, so I changed it to love. We must love like Jesus. Because the way that you love people will be how you live. You need to love like Jesus. And love has been a word that in our culture has been watered down to where if you turn to someone that you say, I love you with my whole heart, and then the very next thing that you could say is, well, let's get some food. What do you want? Oh, I just love pizza. Like, obviously the loves are different, right? It's become a very watered down, overused word. The love that scripture calls us to is a life-changing love. It is something that changes us to our very core. That is the kind of love that we share with others not something that is easy to do. If our love is determined by how easy it is, if our love is like, well, you know, just I had the chance, so I shared it with them, and, and it's not something that's fought for or sacrificed for, is it really love? The love that we are called to in Scripture, that we see Jesus live out, is a love that is eternity-changing. It's not a cultural nicety. It is radical and it is transformative. And I'll put it this way, lots of churches like to talk about how they're a place that loves others. And, you know, we we're just such a loving church. But are you doing what the church has been called to do, that Jesus died for you to do? Are you doing what needs to be done? Are you sharing the love of God? Are you living it out in your lives? And different authors and speakers will put it this way. They'll say, you know, if your church disappeared from your community, would they notice? If you just, whoop, if our church was just gone, not only the building but us, would your community notice? I think it's a good quote. It's a good way to think about, are we actually doing what we're supposed to do? Are we caring for others? Are we sharing the love of others? Are our doors open? Not only that, but are we flooding out of our doors to go share the love of Christ with others? If your church disappeared from your community, would they notice? And because of the culture that we live in, or even in our churches who have such a divine calling, we become so apathetic to everything. I began thinking, you know, there are lots of places that you can go and there are, there are places that you can find food. They have food pantries and food drives, places to get assistance, uh, places to go talk to people when you need help, uh, places that will do after-school programs that your kids can go hang out in their basement instead of here. Like, there are places that will do that. So I think that in the way of Christ, because Jesus takes everything next level. He takes the Ten Commandments, and he's like, you hear don't murder, I say don't hate. Right? You, you hear don't commit adultery, and I say don't even lust. Like Jesus amplifies everything. So in the way of Jesus, I want to amplify that. If your church disappeared, if our church disappeared from our community, would they notice? I will amplify it and say, if our church disappeared from this community, would the kingdom of God notice? Meaning that there are people that can, they can put on a good food program, they can take care of your kids, they can do a VBS without talking about Jesus even once. If, you, if our church disappeared from our community, would the kingdom of God notice? Meaning, are we saving people from death and hell? Because if we're not, what's the point? But if our church disappeared, would the kingdom of God notice? Because all of a sudden, all the souls and generations of people that were to be affected by the kingdom of God in the name of Christ would disappear with it. If our church disappeared, would the kingdom notice? And again, I will take that back to the love of Christ. If we claim that we know him, then we will follow his commands. If we obey him, his love is being made complete in us. 
How did Jesus live that out? What does the love of Jesus really look like then? I think that the love of Jesus, it follows God's way. Now, I wanted to say it follows God's commands, but we tend to think of a command as like, a, like okay, i got to follow the Ten Commandments. As long as I check those boxes, I'm fine. I'm going to say it follows God's way because it's a full life thing. It's not just checking boxes. It's about everything that you are. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. My friends, keeping the commands of God is no simple task, but it is worth it. It's not about checking boxes. It's about having transformation lived out in your life. We can check boxes, and I can be like, I did not murder today, plus one for me. Right? I did not commit adultery today, plus one for me. I did not get drunk today. I am doing right. We could live like that and become very legalistic people. Or we could realize what Jesus is saying here about how we are to live out our love. Because in Scripture, the benefits of living God's way is a life-changing thing. You can read in all of the different epistles. They all have these different things about what it means to live for God. And, and we're told that we should not speak in anger. We should be quick to listen and slow to speak. How much better would our lives be and our world be if we were quick to listen and slow to speak? I'm, just, I'm amazed by the benefits of living by God's word. We should be quick to listen, slow to speak. We're told not to gossip. Now, for a while, you might think, this is a really boring community because what is going on in people's lives? And then you would learn to get beyond gossip and actually connect with people. There are benefits to living God's way. We're told not to murder, not to commit adultery. Not, we're, we're told to rid our lives of sexual immorality. We're told not to get drunk. We're told not to cheat. We're told to forgive. Not because they deserve it, but forgive because of how much you have been forgiven. We're called to hold each other accountable. And that's a tough one. Because the moment you want to hold a brother or sister in faith accountable, that's that, that's that verse about judge not lest you be judged. The moment you want to hold someone accountable, you have to be held accountable as well. And so it's easier just to say, oh, I just don't judge, which in today's world just means I just would prefer to be apathetic because I don't want someone to hold me accountable. When in fact, we should be holding each other up. It isn't a simple thing to live in God's way, even though it calls us to be simplistic. It isn't some legalistic thing where we check the boxes and make sure everybody else falls in line. Instead, it's a freeing thing where we come before God every single day and we say, God, thank you for saving me and I know I didn't deserve it. Help me to live for you. Living God's way, living like Jesus, loving like Jesus has so many benefits that it changes us completely. We have been saved by Jesus for Jesus and so we follow God's way of living because it changes us so much. And then church family, because this could be something that we make so legalistic and so hard-hearted that we in fact lose ourselves in the midst of it, I want to share with you that I think that living and loving like Jesus means that it is something that is both outward and inward. It is outward and inward. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus shares a number of different things about the end times. And in the midst of it, he talks about that when the king is seated on the throne of glory and he comes back with all of his angels around him, uh, he will separate people left from right, and he will judge them. And to those on his right, he will say to them, You who saw me when I was hungry or thirsty, you when you saw me when I was a stranger or needed clothing, you who visited me when I was in sick and in prison, you can come on to your reward. And their reply in Matthew chapter 25, verses 37 through 40, these people on the right, they say, Lord, when did we see this? And when did we do it? When did we see you hungry? When did we feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink or as a stranger and invite you in or clothe you when you were naked? When did we see you sick or in prison and we visited you? In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, said the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. Yes, it is an outward thing where we serve each other sacrificially without judging. We serve one another in love. That verse changed my life so much when I was wrestling with my faith 
that I had it tattooed on my arm so that every single day I remember how to treat people. Because the way I love them shows how I love Jesus. It is outward, but it's also inward. Because in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, he's talking about the inward change. And he says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. It is inward. It is to the very core of who we are that we are transformed by the love of Christ. It isn't about legalistic actions. It is about freedom. It is an inward transformation that causes this outward action. It's about living for Jesus in every thought or in deed. So I want to encourage you, every person who hears this message today, as we think about what is our witness, not only as a church, but what is your witness as an individual in Christ? I want you to do two things. Pray that God will give you an opportunity to witness for Jesus this week. I can't tell you how many times, how many times at the end of my day, I have so much regret because God gave me an opportunity to speak and I was too afraid. That God put someone in my life to touch, to be there for, to say, can I pray with you right now? And instead, I said, I'll be praying for you. And I walked away. What a difference it could have made. Witnessing may seem frightening to you. So before you can speak up for Jesus, you need to learn to forget your fears and instead trust God to use you. You will mess up. Trust me, you will mess up. But I have a framed photo on my wall that says that you are not so powerful to screw up God's calling on your life. Something like that. It's given to me by a good friend. Your stupidity will not mess up what God will do. I want to share one last thought with you before we close. and I, I know the time, but I want you to hear this. It's important. It's important. There's a story about two young men who were on their way home from an away football game. and They're traveling on this rural stretch of road. And on the road, they over, take a sharp corner and they overcorrect. And they end up going down the stink, steep embankment and they roll their car. The driver gets out with bumps and scrapes. But his friend, the passenger, is hurt and he's hurt. Now, there's no cell service and they're a rural area, and so the driver has two options. I can let my friend slowly bleed out, or I can try to find help. So running to the top of a hill, the young man sees this faint glow in the distance, and it looks like one of those medical signs, you know, the ones that have like the pole with a snake around it. And he thought, I don't even know if that's a vet or not, but I can get my friend there. So he rushes back, he picks him up, and he carries him all the way. And as he nears this building, now it's late, late in the evening, uh, he sees there's no lights on except the sign, and he gently places his friend on the ground, and he begins pounding on the walls and the door. And it's this house with like this clinic attached. And he thinks, even if it's just a vet, there's something they can do. And an old man opens the door, and the young man explains, he says, we've been in an accident, my friend, he is hurt bad. It's life and death. And the old man says, there's nothing I can do. I stopped practicing years ago. And panicking, the young man looks at him incredulously and he says, but your sign, you still have your sign up. The old man says, I just keep that up to remind me of the way things once were. And as he looks at his dying friend, the young man turns to the old doctor and he yells in anger, then take down your sign. My friends, if we are not witnessing for Christ and calling people into transformed living, then we might as well take on our sign and just put out a pot of coffee and say, come in and talk about the weather. Life and death and eternity hang in the balance. And I pray that when my day comes, that I'm welcomed and I hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Because the other part is depart from me, for I never knew you. May none of us hear those words. If you'll pray with me. 
Heavenly Father, may we be a people who truly keep the main thing the main thing. That as we remember the ascension of your Son into heaven, as we remember this last great commission that he gave us, not only to go and make disciples and baptize them, but to be his witnesses everywhere we go. May we learn to love like Christ. Not a thing that's controlled by this world or by our culture. Not a thing that's even controlled by us. Lord, may we not fall into apathy. But may we be called to living for him, to loving for him, and to sharing the good news of Jesus everywhere we go. God, forgive us for when we fail. God, we thank you that we have forgiveness through your son, Jesus. And I pray today, Lord, that if there are those in this room right now that maybe they've heard about Jesus time and again, but it has never been something that they have committed themselves to, if they have never fallen to their knees at the foot of the cross, God, I pray that today is the day that they don't let another moment pass them by without turning their lives over to declare your son Jesus as Savior and Lord. God, we thank you for every day that we're blessed with. May each day that we're given, when we rise and open our eyes, may we choose to say, today, Lord, I live for you. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.